Welcome to uh, yet another edition. This is uh, session number 62. I'm still working on my stuff here. Uh, okay, it's trying to access a camera. <laughs> Here I am. I'm even recording this thing. Okay. Welcome. Uh, session number 62 of New Testament Survey, and we're looking at the book of Revelation. Uh, we're all the way up to chapter 8. We broke the seventh seal on the scroll of the wrath of God, which uh, unrolls this 70th week of Daniel, which is the seven-year so-called tribulation period. Uh, I'm going to back off for just a second and make sure we all understand a couple of things. The trouble of the tribulation period is not the only trouble that will ever come on the earth, not the only trouble that Christians will ever endure. It's not uh, the uh, the idea that Paul teaches of a rapture prior to the tribulation is not, and I got to repeat this, not a promise that Christians will never have trouble. I've, I've never uh, ever known um, uh, Christians not to have trouble. Uh, so that's, that's not the point. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the troubles of the tribulation period are a terrible thing that represent primarily the wrath of God. It's a, a, a permission by God uh, for Satan to take over on the earth and do the worst things that he can possibly do. That's, that's what the tribulation is about. God knows what all of these things are, and he permits it. It's all a part of his plan. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the overarching uh, picture of this middle part of the book of Revelation, which is essentially a, a listing and a description of some of the horrors that will take place during this seven-year uh, period. And again, the, uh, the length seven years is not, there, there's nothing magical about seven. Uh, it's, a, it's a number of completion uh, or perfection, uh, but it, it doesn't really matter very much. It is the same with the thousand years for the uh, kingdom age. The, the thousand doesn't matter very much. Uh, I, uh, the, the Bible says thousand in one place and other places it, it says uh, simply the, the kingdom age, a time when the, the king will come, Messiah will reign from Jerusalem. Uh, and that's fine. That's good. Uh, I, I don't think the timing is all that important. Uh, it is what it is, and uh, we don't, uh, but I would never argue about it. There's an awful lot in the book of Revelation that I wouldn't argue about very much. <laughs> if somebody has a different idea. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, well, we can we can do that. Let's uh, uh, share the screen, and we're going to launch into. Ooh, let's see if this will work. Ooh, there it goes. Okay, we ended up with the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour, and that leads us up to the. Uh, judgment sequence that we call the seven trumpets. Uh, and uh, the seven trumpets run from eight through 11. Uh, and then when we get to chapter 12, we've got an, inter an interlude time with some other characters and some other stuff going on. We're going to look rapidly through uh, the, uh, the seven trumpets. Uh, the introduction is in just these first few verses. Uh, we launch then into a sequence of four trumpets, uh, which tell us stories of a bunch of bad things. A fifth trumpet, which opens up the bottomless pit, whatever that is, and releases demonic locusts, whatever those are. Uh, and uh, I, I want to look at that passage for just a bit because it's been very famous. The sixth trumpet 
uh, uh, releases an army from the east, uh, said to number 200 million soldiers, uh, which by anybody's measurement is a really, really large army. Uh, it'd be very, very difficult to feed and equip that many people. Uh, so we'll talk about that one for a little bit uh, and uh, see where we go. The interlude in uh, chapters 10 and 11, uh, two stories of the angel and the little book, which uh, is interesting and we'll spend a bit of time, and the two witnesses. Uh, and this leads up to the seventh trumpet, which is the announcing of the kingdom of Christ. Uh, so the seventh trumpet will take us all the way up to the second coming of Christ. At that point, it, the, the chronology backs up again into uh, what we think of as historical times and moves forward uh, again toward the second coming. It's like a bulldozer trying to push a big rock. It takes a run, pushes a little, backs up, takes another run, pushes a little bit, backs up, takes another. This is a cyclical view of, uh, of this book. So we'll look through the seven trumpets. Let's uh, start off with the, uh, with the uh, first four, uh, which are increasing destruction. And as we read through the passage, and we're, we're not going to look through it in, in detail, 8-7 uh, starts off with hail and fire mixed with blood, uh, with a third of the earth, trees, and grass burned up. Uh, so uh, we can think of uh, continuous destruction of some time. Hail and fire could well be uh, really serious thunderstorms. Uh, God has already used the, the figures of uh, hail and uh, the, the lightning, fire from heaven, uh, as uh, signs of judgment in other parts of scripture. Uh, so massive thunderstorms, that's a possibility. Uh, mixed with blood, uh, not necessarily human blood, but mixed with something red. Maybe it's red like blood it's figurative language. And when we don't know, we don't know. But uh, the, the picture is of uh, natural, widespread, really terrible uh, destruction. Okay, uh, verse eight speaks of a fiery mountain that drops into the sea. Okay, a fiery mountain, uh, a volcano, well, volcanoes don't usually fly through the air. Uh, and so you've got to ask yourself, well, what, uh, what could this actually be? Uh, it sort of sounds like a volcano. Uh, some have suggested this is an asteroid that comes uh, flashing across the sky and thumps down, splashes down in the ocean. Uh, and a third of the sea becomes blood and a third of the fish and chips are destroyed. No, that's fish and ships. Uh, so whatever it is, is a huge catastrophe in the ocean. Uh, if, a, if a big enough asteroid hit, hit the ocean, it would cause this kind of trouble. Uh, and it, again, it could be something purely supernatural. Uh, the narrative doesn't uh, doesn't really tell us. Verse ten speaks of the uh, the third trumpet, and uh, when this is blown, a great star named Wormwood drops down uh, onto the earth, and it poisons a third of the people. It's a fiery star falling out of heaven, and when it explodes, uh, it spreads poison. Now. That again is something that could be purely supernatural. Uh, it could also be some kind of uh, uh, chemical warfare. Uh, uh, is there only one and it takes care of a third of the people of the earth? Uh, no human weapon would do that, but perhaps uh, Satan has something planned. Uh, again, it's a picture of 
terrible destruction, perhaps combined with uh, human agency. Uh, maybe the, the weapons makers will have found a way to do all of this. Uh, the fourth trumpet blows and we see a third of the sun and the moon and the stars darken so that uh, 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 day and night there's this uh, cloud of smoke, smoke and ash and the stars are dimmed, the sun is dimmed, the dust of the explosions, the smoke. Um, this could be purely natural or a supernatural element involved. Uh, the, the four trumpets are an increasingly uh, destructive sequence. Uh, it, it moves from one to the next. Uh, bad things are happening, then more bad things start happening, and the bad things compound and make everything else worse and worse. The, the picture is of an increasingly unpleasant environment on the earth. Beyond that, this is figurative language, uh, and I think that it's a uh, it's a mistake to attempt precise identifications. Uh, a great deal depends on when this happens. If it were to happen today, the fiery mountain would just about have to be an asteroid. But in uh, centuries to come, perhaps somebody will invent a a weapon that looks like this. We can't say, we can't say. At any rate, the point of the passage is uh, uh, this continuous sequence of widespread destruction. Uh, the fifth trumpet in chapter nine uh, has gotten a lot of press and you, you can probably see the, uh, the helicopter in the background. Uh, that's a UH-1H. Uh, Yui uh, gunship that was uh, used in Vietnam. They still use them. They're mostly, uh, today they're mostly transport, uh, but uh, the uh, helicopters are a, a, a common explanation for this fifth uh, trumpet. The fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. The star fallen from heaven to earth uh, is uh, uh, often associated with Satan. Uh, he, so he's given a personal pronoun. Uh, instead of it, it's uh, he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, we don't know what that means, uh, but in John's vision, he sees a bottomless pit and this, this character, uh, who is the star fallen from heaven, opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a furnace. And the sun and air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power, like the power of scorpions on the earth. So locusts, like scorpions, released from the bottomless pit. Okay, what do we do with this? As we go farther into this chapter, they, uh, uh, the uh, locusts are described in a bit of detail. Uh, they're uh, they're uh, said to be like horses set up for battle. Uh, now, uh, horses getting ready for battle, of course, are are covered with a with a carapace they, so that they don't get hurt so badly, and uh, their uh, uh, the harness is just right, and they're carrying equipment. Uh, and if there's a man riding the horse, he's set up for battle, and you know all of that. So it's it's like a horse set up for battle. Now, why does John say that? Well, could be that these locusts actually are horses, but that's not likely. Uh, again, uh, what, uh, what John is doing here is called uh, the uh, uh, phenomenal logical language, phenomenological language. He's describing the phenomenon with the language that he has available. In John's language, there, if, 
if these were pure demonic spirit beings, he had no words to describe it. If these were helicopters, he had no words to describe them. Uh, and so the words that he has, he's doing the best he can. Uh, so he says, well, be kind of like horses and something like crowns on their head. Oh, okay, was it real crowns? Well, it looked like crowns. Something like human faces. Okay. Um, how was that set up? We're not told. Something like women's hair, something like lion's teeth. Uh, that's why I picked out this photograph of a helicopter with, uh, with teeth on the front. This, I think, actually is supposed to look like shark teeth, but whatever. Breastplates of iron refers to the armor plating of some object. Noisy wings like many chariots. Uh, and uh, those who, who've been around helicopters know that they are very noisy, but then chariots are noisy uh, and horses getting ready for battle are noisy. Uh, so what is this exactly? Well, we don't know. Uh, and it's, it, it's important for us to start there. We don't know. Those who make um, uh, certain uh, statements about this passage are blowing smoke at you. Could it be helicopters? Yeah, well, it, you know, kind of, if you hold your nose right, it kind of sounds that way. Uh, it's a maybe. Um, I prefer to call these really bad demon locusts. <laughs> they're not real locusts. They're probably not also real helicopters. I think that these are demonically empowered instruments of war. Uh, and uh, uh, Satan may actually have a better idea than helicopters. We don't know. Uh, and uh, uh, the image that is produced from all of this uh, is a terrifying event uh, the, there is supernatural power here uh, that is the power of Satan released on the earth uh, to uh, do what he will with horrible instruments of war. Uh, so that's the picture here in, uh, in uh, the fifth trumpet. As we go into the uh, sixth trumpet, we see another interesting image. The sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four uh, horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great uh, river Euphrates. Okay, what we're going to see, uh, and uh, let's see what I've got here, this sixth, uh, sixth, trumpet. I've got to, got to give you a little bit more of that. Uh, so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour were released to kill a third of mankind. And the number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. And I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision, those who rode them. They, were, uh, they wore breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, they killed a third of mankind by the uh, fire and smoke and sulfur. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. And their tails are like serpents with heads. And by means of them, they, uh, they wound. Uh, the rest of mankind who were not killed did not repent, and they just kept on doing their evil. Uh, the, uh, the popular interpretation of uh, this passage uh, is of uh, uh, 200 million Chinese. Uh, so I picked up this uh, photograph of a division of the uh, Chinese People's Liberation Army uh, getting ready for Heaven only knows what. Uh, I know there's, uh, there, there's war brewing 
on the border with uh, with India right now, uh, but that thing is happening uh, with with numbers measured in the thousands, not in the millions. Uh, the the fact of the matter is the Chinese don't have transport for 200 million. Uh, it's not even close. Uh, they're they're going to have trouble getting enough. Um, uh, amphibious transport to do an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, and that's a very small thing compared to uh, what is being described here. Uh, I'm not convinced uh, that uh, the, uh, the Chinese are the culprits in uh, the sixth trumpet, uh, but there is an army coming to cross the Euphrates River uh, and uh, prepare for a gigantic battle. Uh, the uh, the tribulation period climaxes with an enormous battle at a place called uh, Har Megiddo or Armageddon, uh, and uh, that's a name that is only given to it in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the same battle has some other names: uh, uh, the Battle of Three Kings or the uh, Battle of Gog and Magog. Or, it, it's given a number of uh, number of names, and we don't know for sure who all is involved. There are some specific human nations who are involved in the the war, uh, and those might include uh, China, uh, uh, but uh, certainly all of the Middle Eastern and North African states are involved. And we'll talk about that when we get uh, just a few uh, more down here. Chapter 10, we see an interlude. Uh, a couple of things happening while everything else is happening. Uh, and uh, then I saw another mighty angel coming. Uh, remember that, that we're in the sequence of trumpets, and we're in between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So all hell has been breaking loose. Quite literally, the abyss has been opened and a gigantic army is on the march, getting ready for the concluding battle. And John takes this moment uh, to, uh, to report another part of his vision. He says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and on his face, or his face was like the sun, legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand. He set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. So here's a scroll, he's got a little scroll. And when he opened the scroll, uh, he called out, uh, here come seven thunders. Uh, and when we read this, we're thinking to ourselves, oh, okay, this is good, seven thunders. This has got to be another sequence of seven with, uh, with four thunders and two thunders and one big thunder that will uh, open up the seventh trumpet or something like that. Uh, we don't know what this is. Uh, because uh, John got ready to write down what he heard from the seven thunders. And the angel says, nope, seal that up. Uh, we can't use that yet. That's for another time and another place. So even from John, there are some mysteries still. Uh, uh, there, there are things that John has seen that he's not even allowed to tell us. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, but there is here the prediction that the mystery of God will be fulfilled in the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is coming up. Uh, so the, uh, let me get that, that phrase, the, uh, the mystery of God, because that's here in, uh, in verse, uh, da, 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 verse 7. In the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as announced by his servants, the prophets. Now, the chief message of the, of the prophets uh, is uh, one of judgment on Israel, judgment on the surrounding nations, 
and the establishment of the mystery messianic kingdom. So this is it. Uh, this is the this is the point. the uh, The message from this angel is the uh, mystery of God will be fulfilled. Everything that the prophets predicted, the judgment on Israel and the nations, and the establishment of a kingdom that will last forever, uh, is laid out now. At the end of that little sequence, uh, the angel gives John the little scroll and says, now go eat the scroll and then go out and preach. Again, we see Ezekiel chapter three. Ezekiel's call comes in exactly the same form. Uh, uh, Ezekiel, take this and eat it. And I ate it and it was sweet in my mouth, but bitter in my stomach. And it was, you know, <laughs> and then, then I went out and preached. Uh, the, the point of the illustration is kind of an object lesson until the word of God has nourished you, you will have nothing to share with the people that God has given you. Uh, the, the, the leaders of the church, leaders of God's people have a responsibility to their people to get to know the word of God very well, to make it a part of themselves so that the word of God is in me and has nourished me and has transformed and built my life. And at that point, I'm ready. I'm prepared uh, to uh, share what I've learned with others, not until. Uh, it's a good principle. We find that principle in Ezekiel. We find that principle in other words in uh, most of scripture. Uh, and uh, here I think John is getting exactly the same object lesson. There's nothing, nothing mystical about eating the scroll. Uh, make it a part of you. Let it nourish you. Chapter 11 uh, describes two witnesses. Uh, John is told to rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Again, a reminder that the, uh, the temple will exist in Jerusalem during this tribulation period. And uh, at the point in the uh, seven year period when John is told to go measure the temple, it's got to be about halfway through because the temple will not have been desecrated yet. Don't measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out for it is given over to the nations or the, uh, the Gentiles, the ethnoi. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Okay, 42 months uh, is, uh, oh, let's... Uh, Let's divide by uh, whatever we have to. And it comes out about three and a half years. Uh, they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now that again, uh, reminds us of uh, Jesus prophecy that the time of the Gentiles will continue and the Gentiles will continue to trample the holy city and the Temple Mount underfoot until the second coming. So again, this is the the picture of the uh, the approaching second coming. And here, John is told they've got forty two months to do this, and at that point, it's coming. So during this time, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. Now, if you do a little bit of uh, math, you'll find out that 1,260 days is just a tad short of three and a half years. Um, they're, they're interesting. Uh, the, uh, uh, let me get my, my Bible back up again. Uh, the, uh, these two, two witnesses, these are the two olive trees Okay, the olive trees are typically a symbol of 
uh, Israel. Sometimes they're a symbol of light. Sometimes they're a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what is it here? Well, we don't know. These are the two olive trees and two lampstands. The lampstand is usually the symbol of light and ministry. Uh, they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone would harm them, fire goes out of their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would, uh, would harm them, this is how he is doomed. And they have the power to shut the sky so no rain may fall during the days of their prophecy. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Okay, uh, the two witnesses sound an awful lot like the Old Testament characters, Moses and Elijah. Moses could turn water into blood. He could strike the earth with plagues. Elijah could close up the heavens from the water. He could call down fire from heaven. Uh, so Moses and Elijah are uh, symbolic in the Old Testament of uh, the, the law and the prophets. Moses is the giver of the law. Uh, Elijah is the first of the prophets of the latter times. Um, some interpreters uh, believe that uh, Moses and Elijah themselves are reincarnated somehow uh, and uh, uh, come to walk around on the earth. And of course, God can do that. There's, uh, there's no uh, particular reason that that's impossible. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, so I don't I don't insist that this be Moses and Elijah, but these are two characters who have the, the power and the attributes of Moses and Elijah. Uh, they will have the, uh, uh, the authority to tell the truth to the world for, uh, for a good period of time, but the, the beast from the pit and uh, I'll have to introduce you to the beast here in just a, just a moment. The beast who comes up from the pit will kill them, but not until their work is done. After they've been killed and laid in the street for a while, uh, they, their bodies will be desecrated by uh, the followers of the Antichrist, and then they will be resurrected and it will be done on primetime TV, and everybody will see uh, these two come back to life. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's uh, high value entertainment. Uh, uh, when, when this happens, I'm, I'm hoping that we're in a spot where we can grab some, uh, some popcorn and watch, uh, but it's just going to be quite a show. And uh, chapter 11, the uh, dead bodies of the witnesses, and three and a half days, a breath of life from God enters them, and they stand up. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud with their enemies left on earth in the chaos that they've created, um, watching. Uh, the, the imagery there is, uh, is fairly clear. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the rulers of the earth and the elite powers that be upon the earth are very good at creating anarchy. They're very good at destroying things. They're, they're extremely good at making situations worse. Those who tell the truth are always going to be an enemy of this crowd. Uh, and uh, in the end, the two witnesses, like everyone who tells the truth, will be invited up to heaven and eternity will begin for them. Uh, and the, the destroyers, the looters, the pillagers, the evil will remain on the earth for their destruction. That's, that's what they're good at. And so that's what they'll spend eternity uh, experiencing. All right, that's... Uh, <laughs> The two witnesses. So this is all interlude. And uh, chapter 11 concludes with the seventh trumpet. And uh, like I have said in the past, I hope Louis Armstrong gets to blow that seventh trumpet because I think that would be fun. Uh, but the Bible says it's going to be angels blowing trumpets. 
uh, and uh, unless uh, Louis Armstrong sprouts wings, uh, he doesn't quite meet the physical. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a seventh angel who's going to blow his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven. So this is uh, this is like a uh, public address system saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, by the way, this chapter is the basis of a, uh, of a famous piece of music uh, created by a German composer named uh, uh, Friedrich Handel. Uh, this is Handel's Messiah, uh, and uh, a big part of it comes from here. Uh, and the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped. So here is the announcement. This is the formal announcement of the second coming of Christ. Uh, the, uh, this is very different from the appearance of Christ, the parousia, uh, that is spoken up by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul says, uh, uh, in a twinkling and the wink of an eye, uh, uh, we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be transformed at this last trumpet, and uh, uh, we will go and meet Christ in the air. Uh, this, is, this is not a description of that same event. This is the beginning of the kingdom of God. Uh, so I would argue that the seventh trumpet of First Corinthians is not the seventh trump, or the last trumpet of First Corinthians is not the seventh trumpet in this series. Uh, this is a, a sequence of judgment where the last trumpet for believers uh, is a, a trumpet of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 success of conquest of victory at the end. Okay, uh, so this is an announcement of the second coming. The, the rapture itself was unexpected. It was secret. It was limited to the Christian population. This event will be well announced. It will be visible to everyone and catastrophic in every detail on the earth. The seventh trumpet announces the end of the sequence. As we get into the next chapters, we're going to find that the, uh, uh, the sequence doubles back. <laughs> it backs up again like a bulldozer pushing a big rock and takes another run at it. Uh, so in chapters 12 through 14, we're going to see uh, a sequence of seven uh, what we call personages. They're, they're not quite persons. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're images of, uh, of people. Uh, and uh, identifying them is, is a, bit of a, uh, uh, a bit of a trick. But we'll go ahead and do chapter 12. Uh, and uh, it's going to start off, we're going to start off with the, uh, the woman. Uh, which is Israel, that's going to be followed by the dragon. And uh, following the dragon, we're going to see some others. So, so here's, uh, here's chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven. Okay. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Okay. The sun and the moon and the stars. Aha. That sounds an awful lot like Genesis and one of Joseph's dreams, the 12 stars with the sun and moon. Uh, this, is, this is Israel. Uh, and she, this woman who represents Israel, was pregnant and crying out in birth pains, the agony of giving birth. All oh, right, well, that's not so good. Uh, this is Israel giving birth to the Messiah. Now, the uh, Roman Catholic Church wants this to be Mary, uh, and uh, it, that doesn't work. There's, uh, there's a number of reasons that it doesn't. Uh, the most important, the sun, moon, and 12 stars from Joseph's dream. This has to be Israel. Uh, later, we're going to see that, uh, that the woman is protected, taken out into the wilderness. Uh, this is Israel. This is not the Virgin Mary. Uh, 
Nevertheless, our Roman Catholic friends uh, continue with that. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Well, same old dragon. The dragon, as always in the Bible, is Satan. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a, a pretty good portrait of him there in the, the background image. Uh, this particular dragon is taken from an illustration for the Lord of the Rings, uh, but a dragon is a dragon, and uh, this one will do. Uh, Behold a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Oh, so what, what is this? Uh, the the dragon always has to be satanic in uh, in form. However, the seven heads and the ten horns immediately call up the images of the book of Daniel. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, the beasts coming up out of the sea and the beasts coming up out of the land. This is the the fourth beast of the book of Daniel. Uh, uh, eventually develops 10 horns and uh, seven heads and three of the heads had been lopped off and replaced by a worse one than all of that. So this is the, the final Gentile power beast of the end time. Uh, and he is representing Satan on earth. Uh, this is the uh, the Gentile nations as the tool of Satan's plan. Now, I need to, to remind us again, when we're talking about the, uh, the Gentiles, the dragon doesn't represent all of the nations of the whole planet. This dragon, this satanically empowered political coalition uh, is only, only 10 horns and only seven of them have crowns. Uh, this is a, a coalition of nations. If we look through the Bible for a list of nations that is going to be judged at the end time, we're going to find a very consistent list. Uh, and these will be Middle Eastern nations that today are Muslim. If God holds off a thousand years, things may change. But today I would interpret these as Muslim nations uh, who are satanically empowered, preaching a gospel of demons uh, and uh, trying to destroy uh, Israel and as much of the earth as possible and trying to prevent uh, the establishment of the messianic kingdom. So his tale swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, the stars are symbolic of uh, Israel. Uh, your offspring shall be like the stars of heaven. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. So the, uh, uh, the uh, stars being swept down is symbolic uh, of anti-Semitism, could be. Uh, perhaps this is symbolic of the fall of the demons all the way back at the beginning of time. Possible, but I don't think so. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an image of a destructive intention. So here's a dragon. Dragons are always destructive. Dragons are a great image in uh, literature. Uh, when, you're, uh, when you're telling a story, it's good to have a monster, uh, and uh, there's nothing more monstrous than a dragon. Uh, so that's the, that's the way this character works here. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Okay, so there is the, uh, the anti-Christian character, the desire of Satan to kill the Messiah. Now, of course, that happened at the time of Christ. Uh, it happens again throughout all of history. Uh, Satan's intention, if he can't keep Christ from rising from the dead, he can prevent Christians from being effective. If he can't prevent Christians from being effective, he can lure large numbers of non-Christians into a 
genuinely stupid lifestyle. Uh, he can do everything he can to destroy and to devour that which is good. So there's the imagery. Uh, so we've got, you've got the woman and the dragon. This is followed by the man child. And I kind of like this little picture. Uh, it uh, looks like something you'd, you'd use for a VBS uh, program. Uh, but she gave birth, she, Israel, gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. The iron rod rule of Messiah is a picture of the millennial kingdom. There's, uh, there's an important distinction between the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom. During the eternal kingdom, there will be no sin. There will be no death. There will be no destruction. Uh, and there will be no need for a government on the earth. Christ, during the millennial kingdom, rules over a population of people who continue to be born with a sin nature. And therefore, he rules the nations with a rod of iron. Um, uh, that, that rod of iron is not merely metaphorical. That's the symbol of his power to inflict death on those who uh, betray him and who fail to submit to his rule. Um, so the, the millennial kingdom is, uh, is not, a, not a time of perfection. Satan will be bound. We'll see that in a few chapters. Uh, and uh, the world itself will have a perfect government, uh, the perfect environment, and everything is perfect, but sin will continue to exist. And so the iron rod rule will be necessary. Okay, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. That's a picture of the resurrection. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. There's that three and a half years again. So the uh, the, uh, the hiding, the protection of Israel in the wilderness is a thing that happens during the uh, tribulation period, I believe during the second half. The fourth character is Michael the Archangel. Now this is a, this photograph is uh, uh, one of uh, Michael the Archangel at uh, uh, Massa Michel in uh, France. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful place and is well worth visiting. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the picture is, is wrong and the popes who have dedicated this place have got it wrong. Uh, the, uh, uh, the mythology is that Michael the Archangel uh, fought with Satan over the body of Christ uh, during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. Uh, and if uh, Michael hadn't won that battle, uh, salvation would never have happened. The resurrection wouldn't have happened. Uh, that's, that's a silly myth. Uh, it's, uh, it's very similar to St. George and the Dragon that the, uh, the English uh, Celtic church uh, invented. Uh, and it's just not true. Now, however, Michael and his angels uh, are fighting in heaven against the dragon. Uh, when did it happen? Uh, the, uh, the Bible actually doesn't say, uh, as, uh, as we read this, war arose in heaven. Okay, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. Now we know that uh, Satan had a place in heaven during the time of the book of Job. Uh, he wasn't particularly welcome, but he was, uh, he could come in, he could be there. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know how many of the other demons are, are welcome there, uh, but eventually the dragon and his angels may have, may fight with Michael, but eventually he will be defeated. There'll be no place for them in heaven. Uh, so there is a casting down of Satan that I believe is yet future. I believe that Satan is 
currently on the earth and has access to heaven, but he will be cast off the earth and out of heaven permanently. Uh, and uh, we'll come to that a bit later on. So that's the fourth. When we come to the next passage, uh, we're going to see a courtroom drama. Uh, so I, I picked a picture from an old American TV series called Perry Mason. And that's Perry Mason, the guy in the white shirt in the background who looks like such a righteous character. Uh, Mr. Berger in the foreground is the, the accuser of the brethren. He's the, the evil district attorney who is uh, always uh, accusing Perry Mason's uh, uh, client of some terrible crime. And Satan spends his time in heaven today accusing the brethren. Uh, and so in, uh, in verse 10, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. So there is Perry Mason, uh, uh, who is the uh, 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 our uh, uh, our attorney, our uh, uh, our representative before the throne of God, uh, beating the evil district attorney at his own game and throwing him out of heaven, so that Satan no longer has access either to the jury, which is heaven and earth, uh, or to God Himself, who is the judge. So we've got all of this courtroom stuff going on. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. That's the brethren. That's, uh, that's Christians during this time. Okay. Um, and then we're launching into the last part of, uh, uh, of verse uh, 11, no, 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 12, no, verse 12. What am I doing here? Uh, the end of uh, verse 12, and uh, the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, verse 13. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So the dragon saw that he was in bad trouble. This is during the tribulation period. He pursued the woman which is Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. Uh, so I, I've got a picture of some, uh, I think these are C5s uh, coming in to Kandahar for a great airlift. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the two wings of a great eagle look like. Maybe there are great big eagles. It could be. Um, some have said, well, the eagle is a symbol of Rome. That's true. But the eagle is also a symbol of Nazi Germany, and the eagle is also a symbol of the United States. A lot of people like eagles. Uh, and the, the key thing about eagles is that they are very good at flying. Uh, they, they fly high and they can stay up there as long as they want. And if they want to carry something, away they go. Uh, so it's an image. Uh, I know that there are, uh, there are uh, commentators out there who have said, uh, well, the, the only uh, 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 national power with the, uh, uh, with the resources to airlift Israel out of uh, danger uh, would be the United States. And that would be true today. Uh, we don't know what will happen when this finally comes to pass. Uh, so anyway, he's thrown out. The woman was given two wings. She might fly into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for time and times and half a time, three and a half years. Uh, so there we go. The woman is Israel, hated and hunted down by the devil himself. This is the, this is the root. This is the basis of what we call anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it's uh, the, the great evil of the world. Uh, the, uh, da, 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 da. the story continues with a couple of beasts. Ooh, 
12 through 14 finishes up the, uh, the seven personages with a beast from the sea and a beast from the earth. Uh, and I'm thinking that this might be an excellent time to take a break. We'll come back on Monday and finish. It's going to take several sections to, to deal with the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, these two beasts who represent the fifth and sixth in the sequence of uh, seven personages. Uh, when we get to the seventh person, that's the second coming of Christ himself. So we're, we're getting there. We're almost done. And at this point, I think we're going to, I uh, think we're going to take a break uh, and uh, uh, we'll come back on Monday when I'm hoping it will be a little less hot. <laughs> you never know. And <laughs> we're just hoping there's, there's Roger and his TV screen again. I love that. I, that, that, is, uh, that is really cute. Uh, Alexander from an iPad. <laughs> this is great. Teresita, I see you there. It's uh, good to see you. There's Dolly Thank and then Lovey. Thank you. And Thank the you Lee family. Hi, guys. Hey, bye bye. Eduardo, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Bye-bye, yeah. <laughs> everybody. Yeah. We'll see bye you bye. again. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye -bye. everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Dr. John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.